In today's video, I'm going to teach you a remarkable method you can use to experimentally calculate the distance to the sun, but also take you on a historical journey spanning many millennia, which involves thousands of scientists, has reached every portion of the globe, and has some of the most beautiful and intelligent astrophysical models of their times. In my opinion, the science involved in this measurement is simply brilliant. So with that, let's get into it. Before I go on to teach the modern experiment to find the distance to the sun, I just want to quickly discuss the history of this measurement. The distance to the Sun is of foremost importance to us, as it allows us to figure out many other distances and measurements in our solar system. This can be done through Kepler's laws as well as other means. The distance to the Sun is so important to astrophysics that it's been given the name Astronomical Unit, or AU for short. And although AU isn't used on galactic scales, it makes talking about distances in our solar system easier, so it's important we worked out exactly how long an AU is. For instance, Jupiter orbits the Sun at approximately 5.2 AU, and of course, Earth orbits at 1 AU on average over the course of a year. The first person to try and derive the value of the distance to the Sun in recorded history was Aristarchus in the 3rd century BC, around 2,500 years ago. Aristarchus was an ancient Greek astronomer and mathematician, and was also the first recorded person to suggest a heliocentric model for the solar system. That being, the Sun is at the centre with the planets orbiting it, so he was quite the intelligent lad for his time to say the least. He also came up with an experiment to find the distance to the Sun by observing the Moon when it's half lit by the Sun. This is when the Moon is in either its first or final quarter phase, then using glass or diopters to try and approximate the angle between the Earth, Sun and Moon in this configuration. He could then use geometry, as trigonometry hadn't yet been developed, to work out the distance to the Sun in terms of the distance to the Moon. He measured that angle to be 87 degrees, giving him a value for the astronomical unit as around 19 times that the distance to the moon. Unfortunately for him, this is hundreds of times smaller than the true value, and being alive thousands of years ago meant he didn't have any better means to more accurately repeat this experiment, like by using a telescope. Tough luck. Although his value was complete rubbish, quite frankly, it was still significant as it showed that the sun is much further away from us than the moon is, which for ancient civilizations who could only note that both the moon and the sun appear the same size in the sky was remarkable. Leading on from ancient Greece, a Flemish scientist known as Wendelin did own a telescope, and in the year 1635 he repeated Aristarchus' experiment and found a distance around half of the true value, miles better but still not correct. Luckily for humanity, it would only take around another hundred years for a better experiment to be devised and revolutionise astronomy at the time. Now that the history of this measurement has been discussed, I'm going to go on to explain the more modern and generally accepted way humanity calculated the distance to the Sun. This uses the transit of Venus across the Sun and was first theorised in 1739 by Edmund Halley, the man whose Halley's Comet is named after. The transit of Venus can be thought of as a sort of eclipse event, whereby Venus travels from west to east on the line of sight between the Earth and the Sun, so from Earth you're able to see Venus pass in front of the Sun. Since Venus is a similar size to Earth and is much further away than the Moon is, it appears only as a small black dot in front of the Sun, and so its transit is more like a less than spectacular version of an eclipse, since the planet barely covers much of the Sun. Yet its transit has been fundamental in our learning of where we are and the scale of the objects and distances in our solar system. Transits of Venus are very rare, they usually come in pairs separated by a few years every 80 years or so. Sadly, the last one occurred in 2012 and the next isn't until 2117. So if you're watching this around that time, I hope you can complete this experiment for me and comment down below what value you get. I'll be interested to know in my post-mortem state. Perhaps putting this video in my home experiments playlist is a bit optimistic for more reasons than just this one. But anyway, let's crack on with it. The key measurement for this experiment is timing how long it takes for Venus to transit across the entire plane of the Sun. I'll switch to a board now to aid in my explanation and derivations. You'll need to actually take at least two measurements of the transit of Venus, not for scientific error analysis repeats, but because they will actually differ in time depending on where you are on Earth. And so you'll need a friend to help you, preferably at your antipode on Earth. Your antipode is the point directly on the opposite side of the Earth to you at the current moment. Usually that will be in an ocean somewhere, but there are places where both spots are on land, so choose your position wisely. Anyway, you'll be observing the transit of Venus at sunset, and so the diagram will look something like this, with the Earth rotating anticlockwise and looking down on the North Pole. Your friend will then be observing the transit a little while later at a sunrise on the opposite side of Earth. In this time, both the Earth and Venus will have moved a bit in their orbit, and the angle swept out between observation points and also due to the orbital motion are labelled theta. I call the distance from Earth to the Sun Big D. 
Now your friend being at sunrise will see this line of sight from the transit of Venus. So if I just sketch out how Venus will look to them across the sun, you'll see it's taking a slightly longer path as it travels over a thicker part of the sun's plane. This is due to parallax as you're observing the same event from different locations. I'll call the time of your transit at sunset T1 and your friend's sunrise transit time T2. This defines delta T as the, as the time difference between transits, which is also how much Earth has moved in that time. Now by considering the angle theta in radians, I can write the arc length of Earth's orbit that it's moved in a time as big D times theta. Theta must be equal to Earth's orbital speed omega multiplied by the time taken, which in this case is the aforementioned delta T. The orbital speed omega is easy to work out. We know the length of a year, I'll call that time TE, and Earth travels 360 degrees or 2 pi radians in that time. So omega for Earth is 2 pi divided by TE. For this to be the true arc length, I also need to add on Earth's diameter. I'll call it little de. This is because if you remember, one observation was timed at sunrise and the other at sunset on the opposite side of Earth. And so Earth's diameter must be added on for the true arc length. This expresses the arc length therefore as 2 pi big D divided by TE multiplied by delta T plus DE. Now we need another way to write out that arc length, and luckily we can do so from analysing Venus's motion in the same time frame delta T. Remember arc length is r theta, and if we let r equal big D again, we can now use theta as Venus's orbital speed multiplied by delta T. This is fine here, as these sectors are roughly the same, and theta for the Earth is the same as theta for Venus, as shown by the diagram. Again, I'll write theta as an omega multiplied by delta T. Omega here is 2 pi divided by TV, which is the period of Venus's orbit. Essentially, how long a year is on Venus. This allows me to write the arc length as 2 pi d divided by TV multiplied by delta T. Since now we have two equations with the same arc length, one can set them equal to each other and rearrange for an expression for big D in terms of everything else. Quickly doing that leaves us with big D equals D divided by 2 pi delta T, lots of 1 over TV minus 1 over TE. Here, of course, d is the distance to the sun, also known as the astronomical unit as mentioned previously. You may have noticed that Earth's diameter appears here, but not Venus's. In reality, this method does rely on the diameter of Venus, but considering how small it is when viewed from Earth, it can be seen as negligible, and so not included in the final expression. Some other approximations include assuming circular orbits with constant orbital speeds for Venus and Earth, as well as a physicist's favourite small angle approximation. Okay, so now I'll talk briefly about processing the results. Obviously I haven't been able to complete this experiment myself, as I was just a small lad in 2012. Nor will I probably live long enough to see another transit of Venus to gather data from, just like Edmund Halley. But thankfully, I do have access to data other scientists around the world collected during the 2012 transit, so I will reluctantly use other people's data in this section. I went online and found transit data from 2012 from various locations. The two I'm going to use are from the USA and Australia. I know these aren't perfect antipodes, far from it. However, that's good as people in the future watching this video and doing it at home will almost certainly not have friends perfectly at their antipode. Anyway, the sunrise transit time recorded was around 384 minutes and the sunset transit lasted 376 minutes. This gives delta T as around eight minutes. You can see immediately that the transit of Venus lasts a bit over six hours and since it only happens around twice a century, it is a really rare event. Before I plug stuff into the derived equation, I also need to know some other stuff. Notably, the diameter of the Earth. Now this one I'm happy with. I've already found Earth's radius in one of my previous videos using a sunset. I'll show it on screen now, so check that out afterwards. Our diameter is of course twice the radius, so with that I'm all good. TE is the length of the year, i.e. 365 and a quarter days. Since I've given delta T in minutes, I'll also give T in minutes, which is around 525,960 minutes. Alright, it's looking good. Finally, I need TV, the period of Venus. I haven't made an experimental video on this yet, nor is it trivial to calculate, so I guess I'm back to relying on as well as trusting other people. I guess you could use a telescope to observe its motion and eventually work it out, but I'll be grudgingly stick with the easier method of googling it, which gives TV as 225 days, which is 324,000 minutes. Brilliant. We have everything we need to find the astronomical unit. Plugging it in gives one astronomical unit as 2 times 10 to the 11 meters, or 200 million kilometers if you prefer. Or, if you want to be really cool, this is around 200 gigameters to one significant figure. That's nice, but let's ask Google what the true value of the astronomical unit is. You can see that it's around 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters, or 150 gigameters. So using this crude non-antipodal, if that's even a word, data gives a pretty reasonable value for the astronomical unit. 
I'm sure using data taken from antipodes and more precisely using time period data would give a much closer answer. Well, I know it would, since this is the generally accepted method to find the AU. There are other accepted methods, but this is the one which caught my eye the most and so I wanted to cover. There are, of course, many improvements to this method one could make, such as using satellites at fixed relative distances to observe transits, and others which I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. You could also make some alterations to the method. I thought about using a transit of Mercury instead of Venus to complete this experiment. Mercury transits are way more frequent due to it being close to the Sun. In fact, the next one is in 2032, so only around 10 years' time. That's plenty of time to find a friend who is willing to disappear to the literal opposite side of the planet and stare at the Sun for me. It is possible to use a transit of Mercury for this experiment. However, with it being so much smaller and further away, it will be way harder to see, so I'd stick with using Venus although people have tried using Mercury in the past. I've enjoyed researching and creating this video a lot, and I'm keen to do more, so comment down below anything you think would be cool to see on this channel, and don't forget to like and subscribe, it really does help me out. So with that, I thank you for watching this short astronomy video.